Good morning, everyone. Welcome uh, to the 2015 fall uh, seminar series, the Neuroprosthesis Seminar. Uh, our talk today is, is sponsored by the FES Center and the Metro Health Medical Center, uh, Metro Health Rehabilitation Institute of Ohio, and PMNR. Uh, we have a joint uh, seminar. So we have a great uh, series set up. Our, our next two speakers are Michael Ackerman, one of our, one of our own, and uh, Polina and Kiva uh, from, uh, from MIT. So I'm going to let uh, others do the introductions, but first, wow, I feel like I need to do an impression or something. Um, John, John Che has a, an announcement. Oh, it's really dark in here. Yeah. Can we change that? Uh, I am, uh, so yesterday, um, <clears throat> Hunter and I had a pleasure of uh, presenting on something called Dialogue for Discovery for Case. And uh, I am very, very pleased to announce that Hunter Peckham was awarded the CWRU Medal for Excellence in Health Sciences Innovation. <laughs> very proud of you, Hunter. <laughs> So we have the pleasure of hosting David Reichensmeyer from University of California, Irvine today. Uh, David has over 20 years of experience in developing uh, therapies, uh, robotics for neurorehabilitation. Um, and he is a professor of mechanical and aerospace engineering and also um, holds appointments, or well, joint appointment in um, anatomy and neurobiology and also PM&R. Um, I think what is probably very inspiring to, to a lot of us and part of the reason we invited him to come is he, uh, in addition to having almost 100 publications in the area, he holds over 10 uh, patents and he's had uh, multiple successes translating his research from the lab out into the marketplace. So without further ado, uh, Professor Reckensmeyer. Uh, thanks, Mike. And yeah, th it's great to be here. Um, I've never been here. And uh, even though I, I actually grew up in um, near Dayton, or part of my time, but it's legendary here. And so to see the, uh, the actual thing is really fun. Um, so, so thank you for having me. So I'm going to talk about uh, the need for robotic rehabilitation, or more generally kind of robotics technologies for neurorehabilitation. Then I'm going to talk about um, four sort of mechanisms of neuroplasticity motor learning that we've discovered through use of our devices. And we're just starting to get a picture of like, you know, how do you design these de devices um, to be effective? And then I'll talk about where we're headed based on that picture that we've gotten from our, from our studies with several new devices. And um, as Mike said, some of the technology has been commercialized, so I have a financial interest in, in some of the things I'm going to talk about. So we, in my lab, we've um, mainly been focused on the upper extremity. Uh, I'm going to talk mostly about the upper extremity today. And uh, this is a volunteer, one of our subjects had a stroke, and she has a pretty severely impaired arm. She would have a Fuglmeyer score probably around 20 or so. I'm asking her in the video to try to touch her, touch her chin. And so the question, the question we've been working on for 20 years is um, how could you make tools that a person uh, with a stroke could use to try to improve movement ability when they have that, that level of impairment? Um, it's, it's a big problem. Um, one in six people worldwide, it's estimated, are going to have a stroke. Um, and, the 70s and 80s, uh, rehabilitation robotics was focused on things like wheelchair-mounted ar uh, robotic arms that could uh, help you grab a glass of water, so assistive robotics. And um, that had limited success. Um, there's a couple products out, but, but it was a little bit limited. And then uh, I put here a picture. DARPA just had the robotics humanoid challenge out in uh, Los Angeles County Fairgrounds. So I took my lab out there to see it. And you didn't know, and it was based on a Fukushima scenario, so where the robot could drive a car, um, get out of the car, which was actually the hardest task, and then um, go through a door, grab a power tool. Anyway, uh, teams from all the world 
entered the Starport funded teams. Um, and you didn't know whether to be like amazed at what the robots could do or just like laugh because so many of them were stuck or falling. And so um, they'd look at a doorknob for maybe five minutes and reach for it in the wrong place and turn and fall, you know, things like that. So there's a great compilation of videos. But that, that's just to say that, that the idea of having a, a robot that could assist you in daily living, that's still fairly far off, it seems. Um, so what, what really happened was um, over the last 20 years, there was an increasing realization in neuroscience that um, neuroplasticity persists even in aging. They can generate new neurons, for example, and that um, neuroplasticity is distributed all throughout the nervous system. So even in the isolated spinal cord, for example, uh, you, can, you can have plasticity. And so um, if you, you take this observation that um, there's activity-dependent pl uh, plasticity and you had healthcare costs increasing, then you've got what I like to call maybe a robotic therapy revolution. And I th to call it that, you can, it's kind of evidence. So in 1990, this is, I, this is uh, Googling the number of journal papers with the term rehabilitation robot. So around here, it's all these assistive robots, and there's just a few publications per year. And then MIT Manus, uh, they started in the late 1980s. My group at Berkeley when I was in grad school, and then Pete Lum, who I worked with, went to um, Stanford, and I went to RIC. But we started publishing, and uh, you can see now it's um, uh, almost a, or over a thousand publications per year. Per year. And th these are the sales figures for Hokuma uh, for their different products. They do a, ro a robotic gait training system uh, called the Locomot was their first product. And then Armio Spring, which is an arm exoskeleton, that's, you can see it's been selling, selling okay too. So they're selling, you know, 100, 100 a year though. That it's not, so in a survey of a bunch of uh, therapists in the US, still only about 2% had used a re rehabilitation robot. So even though there's this, this rapid increase, it's not, it's not gotten out to, to like every, every clinic. So, this is one of the, this is probably the most sophisticated robot that we've developed called Bones uh, for the upper extremity. And um, this is, I like the video. This is uh, Steve Spencer, the PhD student who programmed the robot. And you can see that the level of like confidence and comfort he has with the robot. And here we've programmed it to kind of do this tennis backhand. This is not, we, this is not how we do the stroke rehabilitation, but it kind of gives you a kit, <laughs> kind of gives you a, 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 a picture of, uh, what, how the, what the robot's capable of. And we built this with Jim Bobro, uh, who's a roboticist at UCI. And um, it's called Bones because it, it's modeled, the mechanics are modeled after the bones in the forearm here, where you can get the supination degree of freedom without any type of ring bearing. And so we have this kind of chopsticks formation in the back with pneumatic actuators that allow us to have a very strong robot that's very soft. So I'll, t I'll talk about what we learned about that, uh, from that in one of the, um, and one of the, uh, as one of these principles. So um, I gave a talk at the, the Wies Institute, and, uh, which is focused on biodesign or uncovering nature's design principles. And you usually think about that in terms of materials, but you know, I think it can apply to robotic rehabilitation because the key question here for designing a device is how does the brain self-organize in response to injury? And then how can the robotic device facilitate beneficial self-reorganization? It's a very challenging question and um, so when you sit down to make one of these devices, you have very, you know, very little guidance because so, it's so, so, so much remains unclear about, um, about, about that. But I'm going to tell you about four things that we think matter. Um, so those are dose, uh, effort, success, and complexity. And I'll show you, um, I'm going to focus just on sort of evidence from my own lab um, and from some of the studies that we've done. Okay, so the first is dose. So this activity-dependent plasticity is dose-dependent. And this is a graph from uh, Catherine Lang, <clears throat> uh, where she looked at a bunch of stroke studies and just got the effect size of, of what, whatever outcome measure they used. And then plotted that versus the extra time beyond the, the conventional uh, therapy that, they, that the subjects got. And I love this graph because you, you can clearly see the trend there, right? So more, more time spent doing therapy, uh, bigger effect size and whatever the outcome. And yet, it's incredibly noisy, right? So 
the noise probably comes from the use of different techniques and the um, heterogeneity of the patients where the lesions are on different locations, also their support system, for example, things like that. Uh, but there's this, this dose effect. So Catherine also measured, um, she observed 312 physical, not OT, uh, physical and occupational therapy sessions and found that the average number of repetitions of task-specific functional training, which is kind of the mantra right now, was only 32 in, one, in these sessions. So we know from animal studies, mainly in rodents, that you, you're gonna need at least one or maybe two order to some magnitude greater repetitions per session to induce um, sort of, say, cortical map plasticity. And I like, this study is an interesting one. Um, Adolf actually um, videotaped 12 to 19 month olds who are learning how to walk and found out that they're averaging in uh, one hour, they take 2,300 steps and fell 17 times on average. So that translated about 5 million steps in a year's worth of learning. And you can see what that looks like here. So it's kind of exploratory. It's not just straight ahead walking, it's this exploratory thing. And so if you think of, you know, um, and, you know, recovery is related to development, and it's not the exactly same thing, but um, there's probably some similarities there, but you can kind of get the feeling that there's just not an intense enough magnitude. So I, you know, I think a big goal for the field is how do you, how do you get this type of, how do you get the, the toddler walking around phenomenon instead of, you know, just a few steps or a few movements of the arm? So, um, so we, we've built about 20, 20 or 25 robots in my lab devices. Um, and early on, uh, we, we built, when I was a postdoc at RIC, I built a robot. And we started having some skepticism that you needed the robotic actuation. And, we, and it adds expense. And it wasn't clear that you needed to actually um, use a motor to help people to move. And, and yet, we wanted something that could allow this kind of functional training. So we had also had a grant with Microsoft where we used a force feedback joystick to do tele-rehabilitation uh, over the internet. And, but we found that people got just better at doing joystick movements. So we said, you know, is there a way we could get a more functional type therapy and that, we, and that, that would be assistive? Um, and so we worked with Tariq Rahman, who is an um, engineer at AI DuPont Hospital for Children in Delaware, Tariq. And then Robert Sanchez was the PhD student who did this in my lab. And then Sarah Hausman was the OT at, our, at the Rehab Institute of Chicago who did the clinical testing. Um, and we, so Tariq had this arm support that used rubber bands. And it was developed for uh, children who have um, shoulder weakness. And so um, you could put your arm in this and use it to, um, uh, at a table, for example, and use it to feed. And so we liked the design. And we scaled it up for use by stroke patients. And then we put a um, grip force transducer on the end of it, which could detect even trace amounts of grip force. And then we uh, created virtual environments focused on activities of daily living. So for putting things on a shelf in this one, or uh, maybe cooking or cleaning. And we sensorized the whole thing. So now the person, like I showed in the video to begin, could put their arm inside this device make sure I'm feel it, like it's floating. You could adjust the number of rubber bands to get the right amount of assistance. And what we found was fascinating. So we could ask a person, you know, person who had the arm like this, put them in the device, and we'd say, OK, now draw a circle. And the person might not have drawn a circle for 10 years with that arm. But almost Im immediately, they could draw a circle. And then after, say, 10 repetitions, they, got, they could get better at doing that circle. So, so people could start to move in this, and they could integrate the hand with the arm uh, in sort of a pseudo-functional environment. So, um, we, so we, we, we compared it, so we compared it to, um, and, and then you could leave a patient doing this. There's no, nothing that can move here. It won't move uh, unless the uh, patient moves it, so, so inherently safe. And so we compared it with what a patient could do on their own Kind of the standard of care at RIC would be maybe a book of exercises, and here's a towel to remove friction, use the table as kind of an arm support. And um, Sarah Hausman, she went in and trained people to use the device uh, for the first week of therapy. These are all chronic stroke subjects, um, very impaired limbs, like about what I showed you in the video. 
uh, starting out. And um, she would train them for the first three sessions in the first week how to use it. And then for the next seven sessions over the next two months, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the next, over the next two months, we do three times a, times a week, she would then just set them up and she would use a, a stopwatch and she could, found out she only needed about four minutes of therapist supervision to set a person up in, in the device and then they could exercise on either one of these. And we compared a bunch of outcome measures. This is called the Fugelmeyer score. <clears throat> this is a score that goes from zero, meaning complete paralysis, to 66, meaning normal movement ability. And, it's, and the way it's scored is um, you ask the patient to do uh, 33 test movements, and then the therapist scores it zero for can't do, one for sort of can do, and two for does well. And it's hard to believe that that could be sensitive, but it actually works pretty well if the therapist is trained on the right criteria. And it's sort of a gold standard. It's an impairment-based measure that's kind of a gold standard. Uh, in any case, you can see here, after this two months of therapy, the reg, the reg group here is the one that did T-Rex, and they improved by about four, three to four Fugelmeyer points and sustained it at a six-month follow-up. The group that did this also improved, but less, and tended not to sustain as well. And this is significant at the follow-up here. So it's a small difference. Um, it's a small difference. Uh, people would report being able to do things like you know, maybe I can open a door now or hold a grocery bag or stabilize my checkbook. Almost everyone has a story for something that they could do. But it, um, and uh, if it were me having the stroke after, I, you know, I would want to do the one that gives me a little bit better. But I, but I do want to highlight it, it's still incremental. We also asked people which ones they preferred. Uh, so this is these questions about which would you recommend, which is more beneficial, less boring. And we let the control group switch over and try T-Rex uh, at one session at the end of the therapy. And you can see it's not 100%, but most people prefer the uh, therapy, the, uh, uh, the uh, machine-assisted therapy here. And we asked them why. And there were three answers that, that kind of a cluster. So first, people like the computer gaming. Second, they like the quantitative feedback. And so you might have expected those two things. The surprising thing was this comment, if I can't do it once, why would I do it 100 times? So there's this feeling of um, improved self-efficacy, um, improved motivation because you're taking an arm that isn't able to do anything, really, and now being able to do something that is sort of meaningful uh, within these virtual environments. And so I'll come back to this kind of motivational aspect of the physical assistance. Uh, so Hokama saw this at a conference, and they licensed it from UC Irvine, and now it's the uh, manufactured it as the Army of Spring. Uh, and a lot of the Swiss engineering went into making it easily adjustable so that you could have a, a variety of body morphologies. A therapist could put a person into it and set it up very quickly. We had consistent feedback that to be usable in a therapy setting, it had to be adjustable within about three to four minutes. And um, so the cost now is $60,000 for one of these, and they've sold over 500 as of about a year ago. So it's the most widely, I think it's the most widely used arm exoskeleton now. And um, um, so yeah, so you, so you can use this to, at least you can use it to increase the dose of therapy with sort of a minimal supervision, one-on-one um, -on -one supervision from the therapist. All right, so here's my summary. So at a minimum, robotics technologies, which I broadly define, because if you, T-Rex isn't even a robot, technically. I don't think it's a robot. It doesn't have actuators. It can't move in response to a command. So, um, but I, I would consider it robotics technology. So they now provided improved tools to therapists and patients to help patients train semi-autonomously. And, and it's improved in the sense of incrementally better outcomes on the impairment level especially, but also significantly more motivating than the options that the patient had. Prior, uh, previously. Now, um, while it's, des it's debatable whether robotic actuation is needed to achieve this dose enhancement, but the physical assistance does appear to play a role, a beneficial role in motivation. All right, second now, dose isn't everything, so effort, effort means something too. And we, we had this, we do, we study gait too. I'm not going to talk to very much about gait, but um, we have a whole gait training system that we develop. But this is, this is a robot we used to uh, basically apply force fields to the legs. We wanted, people were starting to look at motor adaptation in the arm by applying novel, you know, viscous force fields 
So we built this robot called Arthur, which has two moving coils up here, and this is a magnet way. And it uh, has a high bandwidth and good back drivability. And we could apply force fields. And when we did that, um, we found this phenomenon called slacking. I want to show you. So here's a person walking on a treadmill, and we're going to unexpectedly apply a force field that pushes up on the leg during the swing phase with a force proportional to the forward velocity of the leg. So the black trajectory here is the normal trajectory at the ankle. Of, and when we apply that force field, the person steps high. It's a surprise. And you can see this is the step height error um, difference from nominal step height. Now they rapidly adapt and say so they come back to this red line. And so it seems like you kind of have a desired trajectory for your, step, your, your, your uh, swing phase. It's not just pendular dynamics. But people don't fall all the way back. They don't come all the way back to, um, they don't adapt all the way back to where they were before. And that intrigued us. That wasn't as obvious in the arm adaptation studies. So we also found, just like in the arm adaptation studies, that when you take, uh, turn the force field off unexpectedly, or even expectedly, because I did the experiment you know, hundreds of times myself, and even if I'm expecting it, you still have this after effect, which takes several steps to wash out. And so this is saying you're, you're sort of forming a model of the dynamic environment. So we hypothesize that the reason you don't come back all the way to zero is because you're trying to, you, you care about effort, the amount of effort that you're putting in. So we said, what if you're, you're minimizing a cost function that has an, a step height error term? So this is your step height compared to your desired step height. And this U here is the amount of effort or force that you're putting in on, a, on the I, I, plus, I plus one step. If you minimize this in a greedy fashion, this will be your, your, your uh, neural update law. And what this means is that your force on your next step, let's assume F is one for a second. So your force on your next step is gonna be the force on the previous step. So just do what you did previously, but now adjust it by a gain times whatever the error was. So it's, it's, it's error-based learning, it's a type of uh, feedback control. What was novel is we found that this F here was slightly less than one. And so, we, and so what that means is when you have zero error, so when you're stepping at the step height you want to, then you're going to exponentially decay your effort. So that's, that's what we call slacking. So this happens from a trial, trial to trial. And essentially what it means is that if you are kinematically succeeding in the movement you want to do, the next time you try, you try to do it with a little bit less effort. And this, this predicts the step height error really accurately. And back here, this is the model prediction compared to the data. Um, OK, so that's, that's, and now we've also found, fascinatingly, that not only do you slack from movement to movement, but you slack as soon as you start to move. And so this is Brendan Smith has done this grip force experiment. So here, you, you hold, a, hold a grip force transducer. And you have a cursor that you have to put in a target. So a standard grip force tracking kind of thing. The target's stationary at different levels of force. But what we do is on half the trials, we do what we call an error clamp, which means we random, just on randomly for only 1.5 seconds, and unbeknownst to the subject, we disconnect the force transducer from this cursor. But, so the subject doesn't know this, we, we, we do this when the cursor is in the target, and we keep the cursor wiggling with their high frequency noise components so that it looks like you're still controlling it. So you can't tell that you're not controlling it anymore. And uh, so now whatever you do here, it's not gonna affect, the, the, the cursor will stay on the target. So the question is, what do you do here subconsciously? And here's the answer. So the red is the control trial. Uh, so going, this is force versus time. So you go up to the target, this is the target. You stay in the target, you come back to the window of the target and then sort of stay in it on the control trial. On the slacking trial, exactly one reaction time after we turn off the sensory feedback or make it non-veridical, you start decaying your force, like very systematically. And you can see the rate of decay depends on the amount of initial force that you're applying. And so we call this, we, we call this slacking. So we only look constant in our movements because we're, we're continually overcoming our tendency to slack or minimize our output. And uh, I could talk for a while on this, but it's really interesting. But you know, if you're starting to slack, that's going to create errors, and you have to correct for them. So we, we now know that slacking is a major component of variability in, in force production. All right, so 
what's the, what, you know, what, what does this mean for robot therapy? Well, it turned out um, when we, here we made now an actuated version of, of T-Rex, and we used a um, sliding adaptive controller for, out of a textbook from Slotin, who's a, a controls professor at MIT, and it forms a model of the patient about how much assistance the patient needs in real time based on the errors the patient's using. And what we found was fascinating, this was Eric Wolbrecht's work, what we found was fascinating was that the patient subconsciously would allow the robot to take over. So as if the robot's adapting and the patient's adapting, the patient would sort of let the robot adapt and just do more and more of the work. And that we think that would have a negative consequence on, on outcomes. So the answer to that was to make the robot be a slacker as well. And so the robot has to allow small amounts of error. It can only be as small as like a centimeter in, in, in these games that they're playing. And if it does that, then the, pa the patient will do, proportion, you know, uh, will do uh, significantly more effort that is proportional to their impairment level. So we like the anti-slacking control. We thought, yeah, but here's the clinical outcomes. This is now comparing in 26 patients, five years post-stroke, same sort of thing as the T-Rex. And we, we did it to conventional therapy, and you can see it's about the, about the same again. So we didn't have any major breakthrough, although I still believe the anti-slacking control is a good, good thing. We think the anti-slacking will actually come more into play for tasks that require strength training, or strength functional tasks that require more strength. And here's kind of an example of why we believe that. So we have this rat robot for training grip force strength, and there's an actuator out here, and you put a food pellet outside of the cage, and the rat has to come pull this lever and pull the food into the uh, cage. You can kind of watch it now, that I explain. So the food is out here. The rat comes and grabs the handle and then pulls, and he pulls the pellet into the cage and then eats it. And we can change the amount of force they need to, to pull. And we can measure their strength by unexpectedly blocking the actuator here. So we make it uh, impossible to pull into the cage, so the rat then pulls on it really hard. And we can kind of get an MVC for the rat. And here's one study that we've done. This is Jaime Duarte and working with uh, Kelly Sharp and Ozzy Stewart. And we did a rats. They received a spinal cord contusion. Um, so this is their max force they could pull before injury. The contusion knocked that down. And then uh, we started training over a long period of time. And we had uh, two groups, one group of rats they just, the, the, the um, actuator was set to just a minimal force level, just a very soft spring. So, and we let them pull for a minute uh, every day. And so these rats would do about 30. You can see they worked their way up to about 30 pulls. And, they, and then the other group, we would adaptively change the amount of pull based on success or failure of getting the pellet. So it made it more and more challenging. So the ones that were being challenged, they're doing less repetitions in that one minute period, about 15. Um, so, and they have less successful pulls too. They're pulling it and not getting the pellet. But if you look at the, the ones that recover better, it's the, it's the ones that do less repetitions in this case, but more effort. So effort does, you know, seem, it seemed to matter for these strength-based kind of tasks. All right, so the summary for, for effort is, um, you know, ironically sort of robotic assistance can encourage slacking. Um, and this is an automatic neural computation that's performed from movement to movement and even within a movement that minimizes effort when kinematic error is small. And we expect slacking to reduce the benefits of training, but you can overcome it by making soft robots that allow scaled error, uh, low, low amounts of error. All right, success. So we just completed this study, and um, this is the finger robot and now made by Eric Wolbrecht, who's a professor now at University of Idaho. And uh, it's two eight bar mechanisms that kind of allow a grasping, naturalistic grasping motion of the fingers. And you can see in the video, you're playing a game like Guitar Hero. So we wanted to be able to, people to do finger individuation. And we, we really designed this robot to test the hypothesis that uh, whether, we wanted to see if, whether the physical assistance actually makes a difference. So it's 30 participants. Uh, these are a little bit higher level stroke patients that could use their hand. Um, and when you assist someone with a robot, normally you're gonna increase the dose of therapy they get because they can move more faster, they can move better, they get more motivated, so they're gonna do more repetitions. 
But because we had this game where these notes come by, and we, we could regulate the number of notes that they were going to play in therapy. And so we had two groups. One, um, so if the robot did not assist these patients, they would only hit about 20% of the notes correctly. That's how impaired they were. Whereas a non-impaired person would hit more like probably uh, 70 to 80%. So what we did was we assisted one group adaptively to get them up to about 80% success. So now you're hitting eight out of 10 notes correctly. And then the other group we assisted, but not as aggressively, and they only got 55, about 55% 55 of the notes correct. Over the three weeks of therapy, you can see they did about 8,000 movements, both groups. So there's no, no dose difference here. So the, the root question is, you know, is this increased success that's given by the robot because it's helping you, does that make any difference? Our primary outcome was the box and blocks score, which was how many blocks you can pick up in a minute and uh, move over a divider. And that changed by about four blocks for both groups and, when, and a little drop off at follow up, but you can see there's no difference. Our secondary measure of Fuglemeyer score, the high success group ended up having a longer, in the long term here at the one month follow up, they had better outcomes. And when we look at self-reported use of the arm, motor activity log says how well you're using your arm at home and how much are you using it at home. You can see there was a trend towards the the uh, high assistance group or the high success group doing better. Now we had verified in this study that the game, this game is so motivating and the, and the way, it's the third most popular video game invented and the way we do the assistance uh, makes it so people do not slack in this. There's no slacking in this game. So there's, you know, so the, the high success is not ca causing slacking here. Interestingly, we took, we asked in the, all the training sessions, we took a motivation inventory and the high success group reported being significantly more motivated for the therapy. And they said that they're putting more effort into the therapy because you know, with the high success, so that's really interesting. So when you have higher success, you feel like you're putting more effort into the therapy. So we see a sort of limited, you know, so it seems like this kind of, you know, high assistance can be beneficial. So what, what are some of the mechanisms? You know, so one idea is that the success kind of breeds self-training. So if you, if you get success in the clinic, then you're more likely to use your limb at home and then you self-train at home. And I, I, I like that idea because what you see here is they're reporting using the limb more and really you see the difference out at the follow-up. So maybe when they've had time to sort of use that limb more. However, it could also be sort of heavy in learning. And this heavy in learning hypothesis is really sort of undergirded robotic therapy, but no one's been able to test it. This is the idea that if I give a motor output, um, uh, then, uh, uh, and the robot now helps me move, then it enhances my proprioceptive input in a time-correlated way with the motor output. And that sensory feedback then could sort of, uh, maybe in sensory motor association or sensory motor cortex areas, they could uh, uh, cause a heavy and tight process as long as they're correlated. And without the robot assistance, if I can't move very much, I don't get that enhanced proprioception. Obviously, that would require intact proprioception for that to be true. So I'll show you data on that in a second. We also think it could be related to reward system. So we know that motor success pr promotes retention through dopamine. Robotic assistance promotes success. Rewards that are greater than expected activate dopamine cells more. So you know, you're trying to move. You come into the clinic, and all of a sudden, you, you can move better than you expected to. And uh, visual rewards likely sufficient for that effect. Um, so, okay, so let's, I'm going to just talk, a, we don't know the answer, it's probably all three of those things is my feeling, but here, I just want to show you a couple things. Here's Jaime Duarte did a virtual golf putting task with healthy subjects, but we found a really interesting thing. Here we did error reduction, error augmentation. So they're holding a haptic robot, and if you were going to putt the ball too hard, then error reduction, the robot would slow you down so you would sink the putt. So just all of a sudden, you'd start sinking putts, unbeknownst to you why. And error augmentation, if you're going to hit the ball too hard, it would then accelerate you even more. So it would make your errors even larger. So unbeknownst to you, you'd start missing a lot more. Three-day experiment, day one, just baseline. Day two, we turn those force fields on just for about 80 putts in the middle of the day. Day three, they come back several days later, and they putt without any force fields. Turns out these are about the same benefit. They, they don't really help you learn how to putt, unfortunately. <laughs> that would have been nice. 
But when you asked about motivation, I thought this was enjoyable. After working at this test, I felt competent. When we give that, that error augmentation, people's motivation and self-efficacy goes down. Fascinatingly, three days later, when they're putting just as well as, they, as the other groups, they still think this is like they're not any good. So this fail, experience of failure during motor training can have a long, persistent, demotivating effect. So I think robots, again, with that motivation theme, can, can play a role in that. On the heavy and learning, uh, Morgan Ingmanson, we did fMRI, and she looked at um, people playing uh, kind of like a guitar hero in the magnet uh, with a button box. And she looked at, normally you're going to have your sensory activity should be lateralized to one side of your brain. Uh, but after a stroke, she found that people didn't lateralize it uh, to the ipsilesional side anymore. So they're trying to play it with their, their uh, stroke-affected hand. So it should normally be on the ipsilesional side. And what we found is this laterality index predicts. So the way that you're processing proprioceptive input, if you're doing it sort of in a normal way, you got more improvement from the robotic therapy. So that supports the Hebbian idea. We also measured, we have a sort of novel measure of finger proprioception, which is we, you, we blindfold someone or put a, something over their hand, and then the robot slowly moves the two fingers over each other. And then you have to hit a button when they cross. And we saw that the people who made large errors with that also did not benefit from the robotic therapy. And so it's, we didn't find any correlation with motor function at baseline with the amount of improvement. So it does seem like the sensory, especially the proprioceptive input, at, and the way that you're processing proprioceptive information at, at baseline matters a lot. All right. So I think this, keep in mind, this is for the fingers, so highly sensate, huge cortical representations. Uh, so the success seems beneficial, encouraging self-training, maybe Hebbian. Um, and this Hebbian hypothesis, I think, is, is worth further pursuing. All right, so the last principle is complexity. And this is how we actually use bone in therapy. And I think I'll, I'll, I'll go kind of quickly through this. Um, but you can see here this person's driving a motorcycle through Death Valley. And um, you can see how he used to drive a motorcycle before his uh, stroke. So you can see how engaged he is with it. And the robot's kind of helping. And if he stopped trying it, he would start driving off the road. It doesn't help him. It won't steer him down the middle of the road without him doing anything. Um, so we compared training with these kind of functional multi-joint movements. That's why we built that complicated robot. And we had these games that were more functional. And then patients did this for a month, took a break, then came back and did just one joint at a time, simple one joint at a time. So we're trying to really set the study up to show that this was better and you need complicated robots. And what we found is that this is the first principal component of all the clinical outcomes. We did like probably 10 measures. But you can see the individual joint training was actually better in this first, first period. And then when they crossed over, now the group that now is getting individual joint, they actually do better in the second period. Very succinct. It's not significant. So I'll note that. It just approached. But it, it, it decent power on the study, actually, with the, with the crossover design. So that was very striking to us. So we, we also found a similar thing training healthy subjects that they, it, you learn it, a task like a tennis backhand faster if you practice the subcomponents of it um, instead of just practicing the whole movement together. So much to our surprise, functional multiple tra training was not decisively better. In retrospect, looking at what my kids do when they learn music and uh, lacrosse or tennis or whatever, they practice subcomponents of movement. Um, so training these components or primitives may, in fact, ultimately improve generalization of learning, we think. All right, so just to summarize what we learned, people you know, with these devices, they get usually about 10 to 30% better relative to baseline if it encourages repetition and effort. The success seems important and beneficial, but kind of complex. And then we, we think we can use simpler mechanisms. So just to finish up, I'll show you three devices now that we've made that sort of take that idea. So this one, it's, let's, let's just practice you know, functional components of movement. So this Nitsan Friedman made a glove that has conductive fabric on it, and it senses when you're making different grips, like a key wrench or uh, pencil grips. And then you play Guitar Hero, third most popular video game ever invented. And uh, 
you do a lot of grips because the notes, the you know, notes are coming quickly at, at you. And so in this study, we gave, gave it to people to take home. And the, there's a three, three weeks at home. They, this is what we asked them to do, the total number of grips accumulating over time. This is what they actually did. We like that. That's really cool. So great game. Only one way to put the glove on. Uh, everyone likes listening to music. And so people really do a lot of therapy with this. This is the motor activity log. The blue is how much they improved while they were doing the music glove. This is a conventional therapy. And then they cro this group crossed over to the music glove at the one month follow up and then got the benefit. So at least in the self reports of hand activity, whether it's just an attentional effect, like, hey, I'm paying more attention to my hand, or there's actually a motor effect, we do see motor benefits in, in clinical testing too. So that's the first device. Next one, uh, I showed you this video. So we were, we were challenged by Don Schoendorfer, the founder of Free Wheelchair Mission. He's an organization that makes a low-cost wheelchair for, um, for people, the 100 million people in the world that need a wheelchair that can't afford one. And so he said, could you do what you learned with bones and do something like that would be inexpensive that you could use anywhere? And so we came up with this idea based on a study in Belgium of using resonance. And so there's rubber bands here, and it's basically it converts it to like a rocking chair. So like a little kid on a swing, if you, if you push at the right time, you get rewarded with a larger range of motion. So here's your active range of motion. This is when you're not rocking, you just push forward. And when you rock, you get double the range of motion. So you get rewarded for trying to move with a coordinated pattern. And the president of the AOTA said this is like you know, a precursor to the reach to grasp. You know, so it's a, it's a functional component again. Tested it in Mexico City, got a large Fuglemeyer increase, at least for those subjects. And fascinatingly, what we found is people you know, we had them rocking in place, but we, it turns out people can actually move over ground. Um, so um, here I'm gonna bring in a, a uh, so, so where we're moving now to this is um, to use this for inpatients. And, and, and so this person, I'm gonna ask him to try, you know, try to propel his wheelchair. So person comes in with a stroke. Most people are in chairs, they're spit unstable in gait. They're going to be in a chair for maybe six, eight hours a day. There's some studies that show. Um, and it's good to be able to get around to socialize and have stimulation. People can't by manually propel a chair. There's some one-arm wheelchairs, but that's just going to contribute to the disuse of that, that arm. And so what people are taught to do uh, normally is to propel a wheelchair with their, um, quote, good arm and good leg. So you use your good arm and your good leg, and you do this to get around. But again, that's just contributing to this lack of use of this impaired arm. So what we found is with the right leverage and taking away that requirement to do hand grasp, people can actually propel themselves. So very simple idea, but we, I think this is gonna have a very nice benefit to people to, to, do, this, to, to do this when they're inpatient. So we're gonna have to be careful about developing shoulder pain and things like that. And uh, people are really highly motivated by this um, too, because they're using this arm that you know, they don't really use for anything, and now they can do something meaningful. Um, if your therapist doesn't want you wandering down the hallway, then you can hook up a video game like this to it. So, and if you stop moving, it stops moving. So again, you get this kind of requirement to do, to put out effort. And I think there's a little snippet at the end here. Okay, so he said, you know, many people became emotional. We've tested about 20 people, and they all could do this. He said he, you know, he felt a sense of fulfillment that he could use this arm that he doesn't use, use for anything. And just to show you a couple more videos. This, then, this will show you that, you know, the question is, can you turn? Yeah, all right. So here's a person now, and she's going to use her good hand to squeeze a uh, brake in order to, and then push with the impaired hand to turn. So again, we have to be probably careful about comp, you know, sort of compensation, about shoulder loading, and things like that. And then these are all people with chronic strokes, so we don't know if it's people with more flaccid type paralysis, if it's going to be able to do this. But simple idea, and we're really excited about it. Here's one more person. And we now have a version where you can back up as well. And we're actually integrating a hand grip here 
so that you can integrate use of your hand to steer the chair of your impaired hand. So you could bring in the need for using the impaired hand as well as the arm. All right, and the final thing is we are now developing another wearable sensor called the manometer, and we call this a Fitbit for the fingers. And what this is is you wear a ring that's a magnet. It's a magician's ring. And then back at the wrist here, we have um, a, a board that has traditional three-axis accelerometer in it for wrist accelerometry, but it also has um, two three-axis magnetometers. And by looking at the, def uh, the change in the magnetic field back at the, uh, there's the ring. We can infer wrist radial ulnar deviation, wrist flexion extension, and finger flexion extension. Or we can get the XYZ location of the uh, magnet to about a centimeter accuracy. And uh, people, so the main thing I want to emphasize here is that this is, this is actually uh, non-obtrusive. People will wear this. We gave this to 30 people, asked them to wear it all day long, and they wore it about half the day on average. And uh, so we're just analyzing that data now. So the idea there is you could wear that, an alarm could go off, vibrate, hey, you haven't been using your arm, you haven't been using your hand. So again, go back to that toddler that's taking all those steps every day. Could we, we you know, hey, you know what? I haven't seen your fingers move for a while. Now we could detect now with the device it's going to vibrate and it won't stop vibrating until you, you move your fingers. You know, so that, that, that's kind of the, the idea that we're going with there. All right, and then the last slide is just where's the field headed? And I really think we're going to be moving into this phase now with combination therapies. So using electrical stimulation, for example, uh, FES, uh, epidural stimulation. I'm working with groups doing stem cell therapies. Um, this is a rat robot we developed with Reggie Edgerton and Ray DeLeon. This rat has a complete spinal cord transection, but it was delivered as a neonate. So that young spinal cord allows a robust recovery of stepping. Uh, with the appropriate body weight support. And um, so the stem cell kind of hope is reverting to that younger state. And so we're, we're, we're working uh, with stem cell biologists. And then I think also the other thing we're going to see is now a revolution in wearables. We're already seeing it. Um, and that's partly enabled through 3D printing. So here's Tariq Rahman's device now 3D printed for a little girl with arm weakness. And um, the video is actually produced by the 3D printing company. So they can scale this thing up easily now as she grows. Uh, it's low cost to make. Um, here you can see when she's not wearing it, she's not able to lift her arms. I just think that's the best wearable I've seen, this device. And you're going to see that with uh, wearable sensors as well. Um, there's Tariq. So um, we're going to see this like, I think there'll be kind of this push away from the big heavy robots to this more kind of wearable, lighter kind of thing, sensorized kinds, kinds of thing. So, And then uh, just to conclude, all my collaborators, I tried to mention many of them as we went through, and then NIDR, and, uh, or uh, NIDLR now it's called, and also uh, NIH and CMRR have been the, support, the main supporters of this work. So thank you very much. Yeah, Bob. So I'm curious what you think the ceiling effect is on the, not on, the, on this last thing, but on the, on the stroke rehab. Oh, why well, people think it was. I mean, because the, I mean, there, there was clearly a beneficial, beneficial impact, but it wasn't large, and it seemed to saturate kind of at the same. Yeah, yeah, there's this paradox, because all the studies I've shown you are chronic stroke patients. There's thought to plateau, and yet they have residual capacity, and yet the residual capacity is limited. Right? So that's a, this is all these paradox. So um, I think that the residual, residual capacity, or I'm sorry, the uh, fundamental limit is how much neural resource you have left. And if I had to pick one thing, it's how hard you can drive your motor neural pulse. I think that's the, probably the rate limiting thing. Um, and I, I made a computational model. So another thing I didn't mention is people are starting to try to mathematically model rehab. And we have a little model, and that, that model of trying to search for upper motor neurons that can activate your motor neural pulse. That explains a lot of rehab findings, like um, this kind of fake plateau and a little bit of residual capacity, and like uh, the way that activity shifts to secondary motor areas and things like that. So I, I think anatomy constrains, the residual anatomy constrains what the ultimate benefit is. And so that's why there's hope with the stem cell 
for example, if you're getting more anatomy. Um, you know, but then I believe that you'll have to train that anatomy to be functional, like the little kid walking around. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's my opinion there. So it will be a great day when we can go beyond four-point Fuglemeier effects because not only, for, I mean, obviously for the person getting the therapy, but also when we have better, like, signal to noise ratio so we can actually see, like, this type of thing works better than this type of thing. Because right now we're right at, we're really in that noisy kind of level. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Similar techniques could prove beneficial for acute stroke? Yeah, yeah. The MIT group's done quite a bit with um, acute or subacute patients. Um, we find it difficult. Our subacute patients, when we try to recruit them, they're actually, I mean, there's a major life event. Um, they're getting therapy already. Uh, it can be challenging, but people are definitely using these devices, and there's good data. Um, there's systematic reviews showing their eff efficacious. Interestingly, um, I didn't mention it, but in that Catherine Lang dose study, that, that was both acute and chronic studies thrown together. And she found no difference in effect sizes from sub, because there's a thought that if you do it subacutely, you should benefit more from the therapy, because there's, you actually have um, sort of activated plasticity mechanisms that aren't normally activated. Uh, soon after the injury activates some unusual plasticity things. So um, yeah, so that, that story's kind of still out. But yeah, you definitely could, can use them, and there's, there, we, just, we just find it harder to recruit. Yeah. We're doing a subacute music, stu music club study right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Um, what is your experience with um, getting for, for patients to get used to the device? So motivation is important, right? So you yeah. have, you're providing a variety, you're providing motivation. Do you think you need to switch? Do you think you need to switch games? Oh, um, for the motivation to be anything? Right, right. How yeah. long would, have you looked into that? Yeah, so the, the question, question is, I'll repeat the question, I guess, because um, how, do how do you sustain motivation with, with right. money? How long, how long can you stay okay. interested in the task? Yeah, yeah, so that's a good question. So I like to say our video games are a one on a scale of 10. Like the ones we make, are, they're, they, you're right, I think people get tired of them. Um, the Music Glove uses Guitar Hero, which is a huge franchise that people love, and you can see the actually accelerated use of it. And you're li you're listening to music, do you, and do you ever get tired of listening to music, you know, and, and doing it? So, so it depends a lot on the game, and I think if you can tap into something that's been proven already, that's a benefit. I think switching up things, that's a great idea too, is like switching up, and you want, obviously want to switch up probably the levels of assistance and the levels of challenge. You know, so in the, in the controlled trials, you tend to do kind of one thing, but probably varieties of things are going to be much more effective. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. So, um, you know, Hokum uh, tends to recommend, they have, you know, a range of, of machines now, right? And right. And going from yours with very little assistance mm -hmm. to much more assistance. And they, they make the claim that you should um, go from more assistance down to less assistance, right? Mm -hmm. um, do you, you know, obviously, I don't think they've tested that, but what do you think about that, you know, as, as far as your experience? Do you? I think it's, in principle, it's sound that, for the reasons I've shown you, that, you, you know, early on, you want to probably give enough assistance so that people have success. It's motivating. It's, it's solely just for the motivation. Motivation actually probably has a neuroplasticity effect, like I mentioned, through dop you know, dopamine reward systems. but. Um, and a retention benefit. But then you, you gotta avoid the slacking. You don't want people to get used to it. You want always changing. Um, so I, in, in principle, that kind of schem schematic, I think, is sound. Whether you need a robotic device to do that, I don't think you do. I don't even know if you need an Armio spring. You know, I mean, maybe someone can come up with a really good towel system with a connector. Uh, although, you know, an Armio spring, it, it allows you a convenient way to measure all these degrees of freedom um, and provide sort of consistent low friction support. Um, I'm still not convinced that the, if there's anything special about robotic actuators helping a person. 
Like um, Jim Patton has data with error augmentation in a stroke study where he augmented people and they actually benefit a little bit more. Again, a one or two Fuglemar point incremental benefit. So there you would need robotic actuation to do the error augmentation. But uh, it's still a little bit jury's out. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, a follow-up question would be, yep. you know, you've gone 20 years, right, going from fully actuated and yep. now moving towards something like the music level. Yeah. Really, you know, you're, you're kind of, I don't know if you want to call it regression, but, but what would you say, you know, to a student or a young investigator, are the limitations of React Robotics right now and what might, you know, somebody coming into the field want to address? That yeah, might move the field forward. Okay, so robotic yeah. or non-robotic lines. Yeah, so what, what are the things? Okay, so yeah. fundamentally, we still don't understand how to optimize the design because we don't understand well enough the motor learning and neuroplasticity principles. I'm starting, you know, in my own mind, we're starting to sketch out a few things, but it's still really rudimentary. So that, you know, try to be a scientist, if not just an engineer. Number two, uh, I think the wearable field. So if you can have a device that you're like that toddler analogy, let's get a goal of taking 5 million reps in a year. Mm -hmm. And how are you going to do that? You're not going to do that by driving to uh, Metro, what, I can't remember that, you know, driving to the 10 miles to a hospital and giving 45 minutes of therapy. Mm -hmm. So if you can have something on you, and um, so, that, so I th and again, I think with the 3D printing too, that opens up all types of creativity that can be done. So, um, yeah, so I think this wearables, uh, trying to integrate therapy more throughout the day as a, you know, kind of blending assistive and therapeutic devices, that'll, that'll be a big, big thing in the next five years. So. Uh, hold on here. Yeah. It looks very exciting with all the rehabilitation and yeah. the using of a lot of signal processing that goes along with it. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> yeah, no, we, we don't take advantage. We had one study a long time ago, and we called it Java therapy, because it was a web-based thing. It was using a Java applet, and then it would upload data, and we could look at it. Um, so, yeah, we don't, we don't. Do. Yep, everything's done locally. Um, with the wearable sensors, obviously, you can get a ton of data. So huge questions, like, how are you going to use it? Like, is it even useful? You know, Fitbit, it's basically one number you're interested in, right? So, okay. yeah. If, uh, you know this is uh, being uh, video cast, so uh, there's, there, there is somebody on the outside who, who found an innovative way to get a question in. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is from Ann Bryden, who's a hand therapist. Okay. The program. She, she asked, um, uh, she asked, uh, uh, can you comment on the low adoption rate of the robotics? You said 2%. Uh, despite some of the compelling results that you showed, is it related to cost, expense, or oh, okay. what, what would that be? What would your yeah, impression so, be what that's related to? Yeah, so the question is the, about the low adoption rate. Yeah. Um, so the number I gave, the 2%, that's the number that have tried a device. So they, that's not necessarily like people who were, I guess, I guess they were marketed at I, I, I don't know, of the, all the therapists in that survey, I don't know how many had the opportunity, just they, it wasn't around them. They hadn't yet connected to someone that, that could do it. Um, anyway, that said, I still think, yes, exactly, the cost is still prohibitive. And we're in this really unfortunate situation where if you're gonna have a business make these things, then the business has to, the people who work at the business have to be able to have it be a business, right? So they have to be able to make enough money to make it make sense that that's their job. And so the question is, can the market sustain more than these high-end devices that are just bought by sort of flagship hospitals? And can you get into a more consumer mentality? No one's really been able to get there yet. Um, and it seems like the numbers are big enough, but, uh, but the cost is still really prohibitive. So I think, yeah, for the question, Mike's question too, the future, hey, can you come up with devices that are e efficacious enough that someone's willing to pay out of pocket for it in the range of hundreds of dollars? I think no one's done that yet. But you've, you've gone that direction. Right? Yeah, Music Love right now is about $1,000, so I think it's still somewhat expensive, but, but it's, uh, 
it's uh, you can buy it on Amazon. So we're trying to go to that consumer. Well, stroke, the stroke population is very heterogeneous. Yes. Is there a, any way to separate out patients who will benefit more from this, or yeah. why, do, why is it, why yeah. are the res responses to therapy so general yeah. as when the lesions are more? Yeah, so the question is, it's, uh, you know, you would treat stroke, you would never treat cancer patients like cancer patients, and stroke is even, arguably, it's, you know, it's your brain, so the things that are being knocked out are very diverse, no, two stro no strokes are alike. So what, how come people respond? There's a lot of variability in the data. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of studies that have shown various predictors of who benefits from robotic training. Not so much, there's a few on robotic training. We found, we found in the bone study that a baseline MEP um, mattered in benefiting from bone therapy. I showed you data that baseline proprioceptive capability matters. Steve Kramer has shown that Baseline, oh, uh, no, cortical spinal tract lesion overlap matters. Um, no one's yet made a consistent, there's Kathy Stenier, there's a couple of kind of systems that people have tried using usually some imaging and TMS measure. Uh, no one can do it rigorously enough where you would ever want to like recommend to someone something on it. Like the R squareds are like 70 or 0.7 or, so um, resting state EEG predicts who can benefit from training. So that's another area, actually, Mike, is like, that's a huge one, is like, who, who would benefit? And hopefully beyond who can benefit, what we want to move to is therapy A, therapy B, therapy C. You go to therapy A, you do therapy C because of what your resting state EEG looks like. Or you do uh, BCI-based training to get your ER event-related desynchronization looking like it should so that now you can do the therapy. You know, so, so yeah, so that's, yeah, there's, so there, there's, there's a lot out there already, but no one's really, like, sort of really grabbed onto it and made, made a systematic way to use it. Yeah. I'm really interested about the kind of single component, like individual joint uh, yeah. training did, as, did better, or at least they're just the same as. Oh, yeah. You know, I'm doing some BCI things, and we're trying to train people to do these virtual tasks. And it's always been kind of my opinion that we just let them go for it and do everything. But kind of in practice, that doesn't work so well. Hmm. So I, I don't know if, if the, you know, again, it's a learn, you're learning how to control something on the outside. Yeah. And I, I'm just curious, is, it, is this a success? Is it related to success and it being able to do the task? Like what's the rationale for it? For the component? Yeah. Why the components work? Yeah. Um, well, I, I mean, one, one rationale is that, yeah, you can provide focus of attention on a specific component and get it right. So like your tennis serve, like I, I can get that toss just right before I complicate it with adding other things in. Um, another rationale could be that. Are there, are really two, I mean, that's like a, a sequential mode. That's a sequential like thing. Reaching. Yeah, so that, another, another idea is that, um, and this has been, you know, this is kind of a holy grail in motor control, is that, you know, it's the Lego block theory of motor control. So we can, we, we just have a set of Lego blocks and then we can make all these elegant movements by combining them. And so if that's true, then get your Lego blocks, work on your Lego blocks, right? And then you'll be able to like build anything you want. It's kind of like, so it's the motor primitive idea. So maybe look at what's the first principal component of movement for the set of 15 tasks you want to do and then train the first principal component, because that'll be used to a significant degree in each of those tasks. That's kind of an idea, and that's kind of I think what the music club is doing. Thumb, and then it's, thumb, it's a thumb trainer, and you use your thumb for a lot. Yeah. Any other questions? So, yeah, Dr. Marcellus. Yeah, have you done any direct comparisons uh, between uh, FES is the activator versus robotic activator. Yeah, so the question is, have we done any direct comparisons between FES as the activator versus robotics? No, and I don't think anyone has. And in fact, I don't think anyone has ever compared two robotic devices. Isn't that amazing? So Mike, there's another thing you can, so if you're coming, like no one's ever, I, I, can't, I was talking to someone about that recently, it's kind of, and I think FES likely will probably produce better benefits, I think, maybe, you know. 
but um, no, no one, it, no one, no one's done that. So, and, and and you can also do FES within the robot. You know, so people have tried combining FES with uh, Armeo Spring, for example. So you're getting sort of the heavy lifting, and then F FES can do more that can help with the control, maybe some, provide better proprioceptive input. So, um, yeah, that's a that's a definitely a great way to go. I think people have tried turning the motors off, but yeah, not yeah, the yeah. Um, so, thank you so much, David. Yeah. yeah. Joining us in Cleveland, this is a memento for you. Oh, thank you, great. Uh, and so later today, if anybody is interested in continuing this conversation about your rehabilitation, we're gonna have a group discussion at Metro Health uh, in the fifth floor conference room at 2.30, so welcome to come join. Um, but otherwise, uh, David will be visiting some of your labs later, and thank you again. Okay.